Hello everyone. Today we're going to be looking at a few short clips from a couple of movies and commenting on it or indeed even critiquing it. First up we've got Margin Core. Let's get into it. This is basically everything that we have in our books at any given time but what Eric was trying to do was to work these numbers for levels of volatility that fall outside of the standard VAR model. What are those levels? So the bank has, like many banks had at the time, a value at risk risk estimation model, which uses assumptions as well as historical data, historical patterns of data, to determine what the risk exposure of the bank is. In other words, if the value of the assets they hold drops, then how much will they lose? And the calculation does make use of assumptions, particularly with regard to volatility, which the chap mentions in that clip. If market volatility increases, there is a good, that the model will calculate the estimation of risk exposure as being larger, all else being equal. So they've been recalculating numbers to see what they look like if the volatility increases. In other words, market volatility increases. What are those levels? I'm fairly complicated. Simplify. Okay, the chap says simplify. Now, ideally, this person's boss would have been aware of how VAR models are calculated and what the numbers mean and under what circumstances they can be relied on before we started breaking limits. And we're going to see the limits bit in a second, OK? So really, this chap is leaving it a little bit late uh, to start finding out what the numbers mean. And you'll see this very clearly in a second. Volatility levels are set using historic patterns, basically, and then stretching those patterns out on the 10, 15 percent roughly. All right, so? So we are starting to uh, test those historic patterns. When? Today? Mm. Tuesday. Monday? last Friday and Wednesday, two, two Fridays ago. All right, I get it. He gets it. That's handy. It would have been ideal if he'd got it a little bit before they started breaking limits. He's just about to find out that should the market pricing or the value of the assets they hold carry on dropping, they're about to be wiped out of their capital base. He's about to find this out. But he says, I get it at this point. Ideally, you really want to understand what your risk numbers are saying to you before you get into a stress event, OK, which is really a BAU, a business as usual type of thing. There's no need to wait for the market crash. Today is the 10th of April. We've been looking at volatility in the markets, 10th of April 2025, I should say. We've been looking since the Trump administration came into power. We've been looking at increased volatility levels. We've seen some wild swings in the equity markets around the world uh, to do with tariffs being on again, off again. It's a stressed market period. Really, we want to understand our VAR models before we get into a stressed market period, in other words, during a period of calm. And generally, we can observe when things are more calm than when they're more stressful, usually with the way the stock market is going. So uh, this chap's left it a little bit too late, but it gets, an even, it gets even more worse for him. Hey, what, ooh, once this thing gets going in the wrong direction, this is, uh, this is huge. How oh, huge? Well, the losses are greater than the current value of the company. Projected losses. The projected losses, Will. And this is just our floor? Yes. So, just that trading desk, just that desk alone, their VAR model is telling them if the volatility increases uh, or and or price values, asset values keep dropping, they're going to be wiped out of the capital base. And that's just this floor. I assume it's just one business line within this bank. So. They are in a serious position, but they didn't get into it overnight. One doesn't build up very large positions that are breaking limits overnight. This has been happening over time, and he's just now become aware of it. And also the chap in the uh, white shirt, and um, he, was in, uh, he was in the Star Trek reboot, wasn't he? He was Spock. Um, that chap, he said projected numbers. It's all estimation. It's all projected. The whole point is we do this to understand, we stress test to understand what we could lose if things go against us. So him saying projected is actually a, a superfluous and irrelevant uh, adjective to add when uh, their boss became aware of what the risk was. OK, let's go on to the next one. The, so the Paul Bettany character is now explaining to his boss what the situation is. It's not good, Sam. These here are the historical volatility index limits, which... Historical volatility index limits. Um, I think there Hollywood has chucked in a number of things into one line there. Historical volatility is just that. It's the level of volatility in a market, the change up and down in prices uh, over time. 
index, well, there is a volatility index. It's trade, it's, one can trade it. It's called the VIX, VIX. There's actually, there's more than one. That's probably one of the more well-known ones. So there is a volatility index. That's traders and market participants not trading actual asset classes like shares or bonds or property or anything like that or futures. They're just trading futures on a volatility number. So was he referring to that? But then he says historical volatility index limits. Is he referring to their own limit book? That's my take on it. My take in, my take on it is he's referring to their limits now being breached when the volatility number increases. Their model is telling them that they are they are they are about they have breached or are about to breach uh, their their own risk limits because the volatility level is higher. Okay, so it shows that their exposure is much higher than it should have been. But I think the expression historical volatility index limit that threw me a bit. I think that's Hollywood screenplay writers just chucking in a number of terms all in together. Which. Of course, our entire trading model relies on pretty f***ing heavily. Well, we're now so levered up that once it gets outside of these limits, it gets ugly in a hurry. And how close to those limits have we gotten? No, Sam, we're beyond close. We broke through these limits five or six days in the last two weeks. Boy, that Kevin Spacey character. So they broke their own limits, their own limits, five or six times in the last several weeks. And this fellow isn't aware of it. Um, yes. <laughs> Anything further from me is actually superfluous. I mean, this fellow shouldn't be in that job. I mean, that's what he's paid to do. But I dare say he probably kept his eye on the PL number more than the risk number. And we'll, we're going to see that evidenced in the third and final video from this film. But I'm just wondering, where was he the last five or six times they broke limits? Had no one told him? Wasn't he aware of it? I mean, I would have thought it's incumbent on this fellow to keep an eye on his own business line. So he's clearly failed to do that. That's not just incompetent, there's almost a kind of criminal negligence about it. I'm, I'm able to speak freely, of course. This is a fictitious movie. There's no bank here. This is a this is fiction, right? It's Hollywood. Now, somehow we managed to stay on the right side of it for now. For now. Well, that's the end of it. For now. But to now he's sweating a bit. Let's move on to the last clip from this movie. So they're in the boardroom and I I have not watched this film, but I dare say this is the chairman of the board and the technical fellow together with his boss, together with his boss are all in the room listening to the update for the chairman. Just relax, stand up, tell us in a clear voice what is the nature of the problem. Okay, uh... Well, as you probably know, over the last 36 to 40 months, the firm has begun packaging new MBS products that combine... So packaging new MBS products. So securitization is a 40-year-old, if not longer, actually, no, from the 70s, actually, uh, in the US at least, uh, whereby uh, regular assets like loans, credit card loans, car loans, mortgage loans are pooled into, uh, onto uh, an entity's balance sheet and then they are, as he, as he himself says, packaged into, through a process called securitization to produce one tradable bond that has a coupon, an interest payable on it, which someone else can buy. So this firm has been doing this packaging or securitization of mortgage assets and then selling them on via securitization uh, to other investors. But uh, there's a bit more to it than that. Combine several different tranches of rating classification in one tradable security. Uh, this has been enormously profitable, as I imagine you noticed. I have. Yes, I dare say he has. So the chair is aware, the chairman is aware that this business line has been very profitable over the last, I think the fellow said 36 to 40 months. The, the chair is aware of this, so he's happy. <laughs> he noticed this to me is, is very relevant. The fellow is aware that this business line has been very profitable the last 36 to 40 months. But of course, profit is one side of the risk reward coin. Uh, it would appear that he wasn't aware of the risks that they were taking when generating this profit. Well, the firm is currently doing a considerable amount of this business every day. Now the problem, which is I guess why we are here tonight, is that it takes us, uh, the firm, about a month to layer these products correctly, thereby posing a challenge from a risk management standpoint. One month to do a securitization is actually fairly quick. <laughs> I, uh, so during my time in the markets, a long time ago, uh, at different banks, 
uh, probably the fastest securitization transaction I saw um, uh, as a standalone product was about uh, two to three months, let's say three months at the most. Uh, one month uh, sounds like what's called a master trust. You have a vehicle, a legal entity that continuously issues securitizations. I dare say it's that, but it might not be. We don't know. I don't think master trust is the level of detail that Hollywood wants to get into. But one month for a securitization is, a, is, quite, is very quick. Now, this is relevant to this clip and their understanding of the risk because he then goes on to say what happens during this one month period. Um, so that challenge is, well, we have to hold these assets on our books longer than we might ideally like to. So they're during the course of the, the structuring of this deal, the mortgage assets are on their balance sheet. OK, and that has that means they're holding the risk. If the mortgage borrower, the other side of that loan defaults, it's the risk is with them. It's going to impact them. So these mortgage assets are on their balance sheet. And as the Young's fellow says, they're they're longer than they would desire them to be on their own balance sheet. Yes. But the key factor here is these are essentially just mortgages. So that has allowed us to push the leverage considerably beyond what you might be willing or allowed to do in any other circumstance, thereby pushing the risk profile without raising any red flags. That's really interesting at the end. So the mortgages are recognized as safe, so they can hold more without raising red flags. But they're either safe so you can hold more of them or holding more of them should be raising a red flag. Which is it? It seems to me that uh, someone within that group knew what they were doing, but were seemingly or optically within the rules. So there's no issue. But that, of course, is the whole concept of risk culture. You know, when one is not just following the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. So it would seem to me that they knew what they were doing, but because they were seemingly within the rule, their own rules or other regulatory rules, uh, but they were breaking the spirit of it, they carried on doing what they're doing because for the time being, the business was so profitable. OK, we all know how it ends, of course, with this movie. I've personally not watched it, but the clips are very interesting. Uh, we all know how it ends, of course. I'm aware of it by reading reviews. It all ends in tears, as we saw in 2008 with a number of failed banks on both sides of the Atlantic. OK, thanks very much for watching. See you in the next one.